Great to see everyone this beautiful Lord's Day morning. We would like to welcome everybody here, especially our guest. We would let you know that you are our honored guest, and we ask that you fill out a, a visitor's card and just stick it in the box on the table in the foyer when you leave. The times of our worship services, TV and radio broadcast are on the screen behind me. The nursery is provided for infants to three years of age, so if there's any parents that would like to take advantage of this, you can do so. We'd like to thank Jay and Kathy Michael for hosting the Easter egg hunt. We really appreciate it. And uh, we need teachers for Children's Bible Hour. The sign-up sheet is on the table in the foyer if you would like to sign up for that. A new calendar and prayer list are out in the, is in the foyer also, so you can stop by and pick, pick one up. There will be a youth <coughs> devotional after evening services Tonight, starting at 6.15, please bring chips, dip, and dessert. There are other announcements and info in the bulletin, so if you have not picked you up a bulletin yet, pick you one up when you leave this morning. Leading, leading our services today, Brother Dennis Allen will have our first prayer. Brother J. Michael will lead our singing. Brother Trey Poo will give us a lesson. And closing prayer by Brother Richard Moore. Jay. God is good, and all the time. Let's stand while we sing together our first song, number 68, if you need your songbook, number 68.
We have a few on our sick list this morning. We have an update on Ricky Grant. He's been moved to a new room. The doctor says he no longer needs or sees the free air in his stomach, which is good. However, he is dehydrated and will need IV fluids. Please continue to pray for him and Marcia. Linda Clarkson received her test results. Results show debris in her gallbladder and she'll continue to have physical therapy for her hip and neck pain. <coughs> Coach Daniels of Luverne, who is a member of the Lord's Church, died this weekend and the family asked for prayers. Melvin McKay is still home and very weak and not doing well. Ronzana is still having problems with her AFib. She has days where she is very weak and then days where she feels better. Let's remember all these in our prayers and our shut-ins as well. Let us pray. Dear Father and God, we thank you so much for this beautiful day and for your uh, blessings that you give us in our lives. Father, at this time we pray that you'll continue to look down on us in mercy and give us those things that we need. Father, at this time we want to pray and thank you for our nation. Lord, we're concerned with the immorality that has creeped into our being. And we ask you to forgive us as a nation of the sins that we are committing with a abortion and sexual immorality and many other evils that have come upon us. We ask at this time for the sake of the righteous that still worship you in spirit and in truth that you will allow our nation to continue. Father, we pray at this time that you'll keep us from socialism and communism. We pray for our leadership, for our president and our vice president and all the members of our uh, executive branch and the cabinet members and all the other uh, branches of our government. We pray for wisdom and insight for all of these and for their health. And we pray that they'll have the courage to lead us according to your laws and the way of our Constitution. Father, please forgive us for these sins that we've committed as a people and help us to continue to look to you for salvation and for guidance. Dear Father, at this time we pray that you'll bless all of these that we've mentioned this morning in our prayer list and that you'll be with them and give them comfort and a, a measure of recovery. Dear Lord, at this time we pray that you'll look down on us and that you'll bless the poor of all nations. Father, we are thankful for the progress we've had with our COVID epidemic and we pray that you'll continue to bless the efforts the world over, that soon we may be able to get back to normal as far as a nation and as far as a people is concerned. Dear Lord, individually in our lives, we have times when we are weak. And Father, we pray that you'll forgive us when we transgress your will. We pray that we'll be made stronger through faith that we may be able to bear the temptations that come upon us. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the doctors and the nurses and all the medical people who treat the COVID patients that we have at this time. And we pray for recovery for all of these. We're also thankful for the vaccine that has been developed. And we pray that the distribution will be fair and it will be complete and soon uh, the herd immunity will help us in ridding ourselves of this epidemic. Father, we pray at this time that you'll consider the church the world over and those that live under oppressive governments. Father, please bless these members of your body that they may continue to worship you without molestation. Now, Father, we pray that You'll continue to bless us and keep us in your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Song in preparation for the Lord's Supper, number 203. <coughs> 203. At this time in our worship, we have the opportunity and the privilege to uh, assemble together around the Lord's table to partake of the emblem of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Uh, on your way in, hope you uh, picked uh, an individual cup of communion up and uh, that you will uh, join me uh, as we clear our minds and our hearts of all the cares, the worries, uh, the burdens and the stresses of life that we may be uh, dealing with. Uh, let us uh, clear those away so that we can focus truly on uh, why we're here this morning. And that is to worship God together in spirit and in truth. And at this time to remember uh, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And as is inscribed on the front of the table here uh, in this auditorium, this do in remembrance of me. And that's what we always need to do. To remember. To remember what God has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ as he gave his life on the cross. Will you bow with me this morning as we uh, give thanks for the uh, unleavened bread? Holy Father in heaven, we bow in your presence this morning. We are indeed thankful for your love, uh, for the fact that you have demonstrated your tremendous love to all of mankind on the cross where your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, died, where he shed his blood and gave his life, uh, that we might have the hope of eternal life, that we might enjoy the blessings of redemption and salvation, uh, Father, the forgiveness of our sins. Father, this morning as we uh, assemble together as your church, as your people, uh, to worship you today, we pray that all that we do, all that we say, will be in accordance to your will. Dear Father, that you'll be glorified and worshipped as you have instructed us to be, and that uh, we, we will be uh, strengthened in our faith, knowing, Father, that you are the one true and living God. Father, we pray that as we partake of this emblem of the uh, unleavened bread that represents the body of our Savior Jesus Christ that was nailed to that cross, we pray, Father, that we'll partake of this in a manner that's pleasing and worthy in your sight as we remember what you have done for us, not only today, but every day as we live in this life. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Will you bow with me again as we give thanks for the fruit of the vine? In like manner, Father in heaven, we bow in your presence again, thankful for uh, this opportunity we have to remember the shed blood of our Savior Jesus Christ that was freely given and shed on the cross of Calvary. And Father, we know that there is no other way uh, that man can be saved but through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is as a precious lamb without blemish and without spot. 
And he gave his life, shedding his blood, that we might be redeemed and brought back to you. Father, we thank you for this uh, cup, uh, the cup of the unleavened bread that represents his blood. Uh, Father, may we remember the power and the love and the, the mercy that you've shown to us. And may we focus our hearts and our minds on that sacrifice on that day where Jesus allowed the crucifixion to take place, where he shed his blood and gave his life. And Father, how thankful we are that you love us so much. Father, we pray that you'll be with us now as we partake of this emblem. May we do so in a manner pleasing and worthy in your sight. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The greatest example of, of giving of sacrificing for another person has to be God himself. As he sacrificed and gave the greatest gift that man will ever receive, and that was Jesus Christ on the cross. And God expects us to follow in his footsteps, to, to, to be like him. And I believe that we're never more like God than when we truly give as God has given. And this morning, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity as the church, as Christians, to lay by in store as we have prospered, as we have purposed in our hearts. As was mentioned earlier, uh, we're, we're not passing uh, any of the communion trays or a collection plate, but on the, on the way out on the table in the foyer, uh, there is a small contribution box. Uh, if you have not already done so, you can leave your contribution there. For the ongoing works of the church here in this community of benevolence and edification and evangelism, uh, your sacrifice and your, your uh, giving have been tremendous. Remember, you're not giving to the church. You're giving back to God as you purposed in your heart. Will you bow with me as we pray not only for the gifts that will be given, but for our hearts as we give. Holy Father, again we bow in your presence, recognizing that you are the one true and living God and that uh, all the blessings that we have come from you. Father, we thank you for every blessing, the, the physical blessings of life that you've given to us in abundance. Uh, so far above what we truly need. And Father, we thank you for the abundance that we have in our lives. Father, we thank you for the spiritual blessings that are ours to enjoy through Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for, for every blessing. And Father, may we never take these for granted. And Father, this morning as we have purposed in our hearts and have prepared to give back to you, uh, Father, may we do so with, with love, with gratitude, with cheerfulness. Dear Father, knowing that you love a cheerful giver. We pray this morning not only for the gifts that will be given, but for uh, those who will give and for our hearts, that our attitude might be uh, what it ought to be as we pattern ourselves after you. Father, we pray that these monies will be used in an effective manner in the works of edification and evangelism and benevolence uh, that, that you can be seen in this community as we go about our daily lives as Christians, that we, we might use what you blessed us with uh, to bring lost souls to you and to help those who are truly in need. Uh, Father, again, be with us today as we worship you. May, may we do so in a manner pleasing and worthy in your sight. For it's through Christ we pray. Amen. If you use your songbook, you may want to place your mark at number 267. That will be our song of encouragement, 267. Our psalm before the lesson, number 408. Let's stand while we sing together. Low in the grave he lay.
morning. Y'all go ahead and hold up your Bibles good and high. There you go. Glad to see everybody this morning. I don't know about you, but that last song we just sang gets me almost every time. When you think about the, the power and the victory uh, that that song uh, brings to mind and teaches us about and reminds us of, uh, what a wonderful, wonderful reminder this morning. Got a good crowd this morning. Good to see everybody. I know we have a lot of visitors who are in uh, for uh, today. Uh, I am aware that you are probably going to be uh, anticipating and longing for a uh, good size lunch somewhere. I think most people here are going to Jay and Kathy's for lunch. Uh, the majority of y'all are here for that, I'm sure. I think somebody told me 30 or 40 or I don't know how many are going over there. But wherever you go and wherever you uh, spend your day, we're glad that you're here right now this morning to, to worship with us the one true and living God. Uh, I don't have to tell you that it is uh, uh, a special day, the Lord's Day, a uh, day that we have the opportunity to worship God, and uh, uh, today is, is Easter, uh, Easter uh, Sunday. And I want, I want to begin with the words of uh, Marv and uh, Mayor Beth Rosenthal. They, they, they wrote some words that have to do with Mary had a little lamb. It's not the traditional Mary had a little lamb, and I hope you've seen this before. But it says, Mary had a little lamb who lived before his birth. Self-existent Son of God, from heaven he came to earth. Mary had a little lamb, seen in, in, see him in that stall yonder. Virgin-born Son of God to save man from the fall. Mary had a little lamb, obedient Son of God, and everywhere the Father led his feet were sure to trod. Mary had a little lamb crucified on the tree. The rejected Son of God, he died to set men free. Mary had a little lamb. Men placed him in the grave, thinking they were done with him. To death he was no slave. Mary had a little lamb, mystery to behold. From the lamb of Calvary, a lion will unfold. When the day star comes again, of this be very sure, it won't be the lamb-like silence, but with the lamb's roar. Aren't you glad for the lamb of Calvary? Aren't you glad for uh, God's lamb that takes away the sins of the world? I want, I want our kids to think about something. Young folks, uh, little ones, uh, y'all listen up. I'm going to ask you a, a pretty serious question to kind of get us going this morning. Where do Easter bunnies go for new tails? Where do Easter bunnies go for a new tail? How about a retail store? Some of y'all will get that later. That's just one of those corny old preacher uh, funnies that's really not all that funny but 52 years ago 52 years ago Bill and Gloria Gaither uh, wrote these words God sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love to heal and to forgive he lived and he died to buy my pardon and an empty grave is there to prove that my Savior lives We've sang this this morning. Beautiful song. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Isn't that a great thought? Just because our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, is alive and well today, just because He lives, I can face tomorrow. I can face anything that tomorrow may bring. You know, we think a lot about the, the life of Jesus, and there's a lot of fascinating scenes to consider. I've been thinking a lot uh, this week about many of those different things and how fascinating uh, they are. It's fascinating to think about how God uh, being, being born a baby, putting on flesh and blood and being born in that manger. 
It's fascinating to see, see him grow up. And at the ripe old age of 12 years old, we find him in the temple. And there in that temple at the age of 12, he is talking with the experts of the law. He's asking and he's answering questions. And he is amazing at the young age of 12. It's fascinating to even see him as, as he begins his earthly ministry being baptized by John in the Jordan River to fulfill all righteousness, as Scripture says. It's, it's fascinating to, to hear God declare from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there to hear that voice make that declaration from heaven? Oh, it's fascinating to, to think about Jesus as he taught and as he preached, and all, all the parables, all the lessons, all, all the times that he would pull his disciples to himself alone somewhere and just spend time with them and teach them. It's fascinating to even, even think about all the miracles, all the healings, all the, all the things that he did among the common people who loved him and wanted to hear him everywhere he went every time he spoke but I think one of the more fascinating and for me the the most fascinating and moving scene is is when we find Jesus even before Pilate knowing that Jesus is in absolute control he's allowing everything that is happening to happen and that at a, a spoken word he could end it all but he's standing there before Pilate. Well, let me just share with you. Go, go with me to uh, the scene. All through Scripture. This, 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 uh, this scene begins in Matthew chapter 26. Now I want you to watch that expert scourger. As he administers lashes to the Lord's back. We're just outside the the halls of Pilate. We can hardly watch as this unfolds. The prisoner is losing a lot of blood and at last this, this beating is, is finished. And the execution team moves in along with all the accusers who are now leaving Pilate's hall. The centurion presses in to serve uh, and help and get one to help carry his cross. His name is Simon. Perhaps because the body of Jesus, this prisoner, is so weak, he's not strong enough to bear it. Well, the execution team is arriving at the place of the skull with this prisoner at Golgotha's Hill. The soldiers, without thought or hesitation, they throw this prisoner down on the ground and drive five-inch spikes into his hands and into his feet. Now the crown of thorns... Such tremendous pain, but no matter. He's a criminal who claimed to be a king. So some kind of crown is necessary. See him writhing in pain, suspended there between heaven and earth in a public place. Hear him as he cries out, it is finished. And at last this indescribable agony is over. Watch through the eye of faith, through the inspiration of Scripture. That soldier plunging that spear into his side, all the way into his heart, where blood and water would pour out. The blood has began to coagulate. Jesus has been dead for a while. I want you to listen. Listen as a prominent member of the Sanhedrin is asking a very formal request of the procurator for the body of Jesus. I wish I could have seen Pilate's face. I wish I could have seen maybe his eyebrows as they were no doubt raised in surprise. He's dead? He's dead already? Pilate had to be sure. And so at his command, a courier fetches the centurion. And we see that soldier experienced in matters like this. He enters the hall and he assures Pilate that Jesus has been dead 
for some time. Mark chapter 15 and verse 44. And so Pilate then grants to Joseph of Arimathea the body of Jesus. To go back with me to Golgotha, the place of the crucifixion. And under Joseph's watchful eye, the body of Jesus is removed from the cross. And, and, and those men transport his body to a new tomb in a garden that's nearby. We'll stay right here for just a moment at a distance. While that body is wrapped hurriedly because the Sabbath is coming on. They must be finished before sundown. At last, Joseph and his men emerge from the tomb. And some of the men, who were very strong, grab a very large wheel-like stone. And they, they roll it into place and the tomb is shut. But we need to return here tomorrow for one more event. The chief priests and the Pharisees are concerned about security. Security. After all, the disciples might decide to steal the body and claim that Jesus was resurrected. The leading Jews will have to confer with Pilate, though. Well, it's now the day after the crucifixion, and we're back at the tomb. The chief priest and some of the Pharisees are approaching. They march directly to the stone. They set a seal on it and give instructions to the captain of these guards. And then they leave. They have done what Pilate authorized them to do. Matthew 27 and verse 65. Make it as secure as you know how. That's where they wanted to make sure. They knew he was dead. They knew they placed him in Joseph of Arimathea's new tomb. They knew they had sealed that tomb. And they knew there were guards in place. It was as secure as it could possibly be. You know, you think about the, the birth. You think about the life. You think about the death of Jesus. All of those things show us that he was human. But there is one event in the life of Jesus that proves and demonstrates that he was not only human but that he was God. And that event is his resurrection. You see, the birth and the life, the death, even the burial of Jesus, sometimes we don't, don't think about how important these are. But because of what Jesus had said just three days earlier, that he would be raised again on the third day, there's a lot of emphasis placed on guarding that tomb, making sure his tomb was, was sealed and secure, that there was no way that anybody could get in and steal the body. You see, God's redeeming love for us, it destroys guilt and shame. It destroys the, the penalty for sin. And Jesus' resurrection from the dead Conquers death, hell, and the grave and brings us victory. Victory in this life. One, one of the encouraging thoughts this week that I have been, been just reminiscing about is how a dead Savior cannot save. And we sang just a moment ago how we serve a risen Savior. Yes, He died. No doubt He died. No doubt he was buried in that borrowed tomb, but he did not stay there. And we know that on that third day, he did rise again. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 that, that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. What did God do in that great resurrection of his Son? He declared him again, this is my son. He is the son of God. And he raises him from the dead. Here's an encouraging passage. It's in Matthew chapter number 28 and verse number 6. It's hard for us to imagine being among those who walked and talked and interacted with Jesus 
as being close friends, as so many of them were, to watch him die on that cross, to know that he was dead, to see his body wrapped in those burial clothes, and then to be placed in this tomb and it be sealed up, and it's over. But then on that third day in Matthew 28 and verse 6, to get the news that Jesus is alive, listen to what the passage says. As the angel speaks to them as they return to the tomb. He says, he is not here. The first thought would be, well, where is he? He was here just a few days ago. Where is he? He is not here, for he is risen. All of that part of the verse is tremendous, but I love the next three words. As he said. Remember, he said he was going to be raised from the dead, that the grave was not going to hold him. He's not here. He is risen just as he said. I love the latter part of the verse. Come, see the place where they laid him. See for yourself. He's not here. He has been raised from the dead just as he said. So we get to sing some amazing songs that Jay has led us in. Did you listen to the words of the very last song we just sang before our lesson started? Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Death cannot keep its prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. And this is about the time when you get to the course where there's a lump and a tear. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah Christ arose. And aren't you glad? I hope you're shaking your head like this. Absolutely. Because if he was still in his tomb, all of us, all of mankind would be lost and dying in sin. But he's not in the grave. There, there's a, uh, I'll call it a, a newer song. A newer song that has been written by Stuart Townen. He wrote these words. The song is called, How Deep the Father's Love. Listen to this. This is a new song. I wish we knew it. We're going to learn it, though. We're going to learn this song. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. The last verse of the song says, I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why, why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Oh, that's a, that's a powerful reminder. A wonderful song of just how much God loves us and even more so how much the Lord Jesus Christ loved us to remain on that cross when he had the power to end it and to save himself but instead of saving himself you know what he did he stayed on that cross gave his life to save mankind you and me and it is from the very foundation and even the fabric of Scripture, the Word of God, that a lot of these songs that we love to sing, many of them we've sang even this morning, find their, their beginning, reminding us of, of God's grace and His magnificent love. And they tell us the story of Jesus. 
Can I share with you one of my favorites? I bet it's not just mine, though. I bet it's one of yours. You'll recognize. I won't even give you the title. You'll get the first five or six words, and you'll be ready to sing it, too. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him. He's to blame. Upon his precious head they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the king. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. And all alone he suffered everything. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water. But they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. To the howling mob he yielded. He did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it is finished. He gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. I love the words of those lines. But I particularly love the chorus. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. But he died alone for you and me. Knowing what he had the power to do, but chose not to do it. What love. What, what grace. What, what sacrifice he made. I don't know if you know this name, Twyla Paris. Way back in 1985, back in the day, when yours truly was about 12 years old, Twyla Paris penned these words. And again, another reminder. It's called the Lamb of God. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love, they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king, they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died. But you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood till I am just a Lamb of God. You see, that's why he came. That's why he came and that's why he went to the cross and stayed on the cross. So that he, as the precious Lamb of God, as of a Lamb without blemish and without spot, could redeem the world from our sins. And that's what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 18, the Lamb of God died in your place, sacrificed for your sins and, and for my sins. We go from a relatively new song to a song that's really, really old. How about back to 1738? Only one in the room I know was there in 1738. Might have been Dennis and Charles, but I'm not real sure. But that was a long time ago. But Charles Wesley wrote these songs. He, he wrote this song uh, right here. It's called, And Can It Be? An amazing question. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain. For me who him his death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that you, my God, would die for me. I don't know what it takes to blow your mind. It don't take a whole lot for me. But it definitely gets blown when I think about God dying in my place. Someone so undeserving of anything and everything he went through and endured willingly. When you look at yourself in the mirror the next time, that is the one who is on his mind when he was on that cross giving his life for you and for me. And if that isn't love, church, I don't know what is. The love that it must have required the Father to turn his face away 
as his son on that cross bore the entire weight of the burden of the sins of the world as he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But you know one, one of the other fascinating statements from the cross is his prayer of forgiveness. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus, I don't, I don't even begin to, to comprehend this. In his position, knowing what he could do, stop it all, what does he do? He prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How, how could he pray that prayer? I'm glad that he did. He truly is the Son of God. But I want to challenge us with something before we close out. I want you to think about something with me and how we ought to respond to this. In John chapter 13, the night before Jesus died, I want to ask you to think about something. If you got news from your doctor that you've got one day to live, in fact, you've got just a matter of a few hours to live, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Make a quick trip on a vacation, maybe see some family or friends or, you know, live it up the best that you can for whatever time you have left. What are you going to do in the remaining hours of your life? I know what Jesus did. Knowing what he's about to face in just a matter of hours. There at the Last Supper in John chapter 13, you remember what Jesus did? He wasn't living it up. It wasn't a party. Jesus chose to wash dirty feet. What? My Savior is going to wash feet just before he goes to the cross? That's, that's Jesus washing the disciples' feet. If anyone there should not have been washing feet, it shouldn't have been Jesus. But then again, of all those people who were there, who would you figured would have? Jesus. Can't you see him getting up, taking off his robe, wrapping himself with that towel, finding a basin of water and, 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 and washing those disciples' feet? That's, that's Jesus. That's Jesus washing those disciples' feet, knowing that he was going to die for the sins of the world what a what a tremendous lesson of serving and of love so what should our response to all of this be well I believe our response ought to be that not only do we serve a risen Savior but we serve a risen Savior who is the greatest servant of all times who not only met our greatest need there at the cross as he gave his life and offers forgiveness of sins and makes that possible, but he shows us how to live our lives each and every day as a simple, humble servant who's ready and willing to do anything. And when we say anything, you can't get much lower than washing your disciples feed but that's what he does and that's what we are to do Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me you see, he did not come to be served himself. In fact, Jesus said himself in Matthew 20, verse 28, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So this morning, as we leave this place, going back out into our mission field, my challenge is for us to remember who we are and what we are to be doing 
We are to be servants just like Jesus. My challenge is as you go out into that world, out into your mission field like Jesus, open your eyes, your ears, your heart, and your life to the needs of people around you and serve them to the very best of your ability. Because after all, that's what Jesus did. And that's what Jesus would have each and every one of us to do. Maybe this morning as we ponder, as we think for just a little bit about our Savior, Jesus Christ, aren't you glad He was born? Yes. Aren't you glad that He came and lived a sinless and perfect life that He would be and could only be Him, the perfect Lamb of God, who would die in your place and in my place? And that through his blood, you and I, so undeserving, could have the hope of forgiveness. That we can enjoy the blessing and the hope of heaven if we would but obey and remain faithful to him. Knowing what he has done for us and continues to do for us each and every day. Is there anything that he could ever ask of us that would be too much? Absolutely not. But what will we do with Jesus? What will you do with him? He's done so much for you. Will you today decide, hey, I need to obey the gospel. I know, I know, and I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I'm, I'm ready and willing to repent of my sins, to confess my faith in Christ, and to be immersed, to be, to be baptized and buried in the watery grave of baptism, be raised to walk in newness of life. I'm ready to put Christ on. In baptism maybe you've done that in time past but you haven't been the servant instead of living a a selfless humble life it's been very selfish and worldly and maybe this morning as Christians we need to get back following Jesus closer walking more in his footsteps being like him so that one day when all of life is over we can all hear him declare well done good and faithful servant this morning we can help in any way whatever the need may be you're not coming to the preacher you're not coming to the church you're coming to Christ if we can help you do that in any way come as we stand and sing
again, it is good to see everybody this morning. We've got quite a few visitors with us. We want you to know uh, that you're an honored guest. We ask that as we leave, we all go out into uh, the foyer, on out into the parking lot and talk all you want to. Uh, but we're glad that you're here. Hope you'll come back at any and every opportunity you have. Tonight we're going to meet at 5 o'clock in person and on Facebook Live. And we're going to talk about thank God for the cross. Talk about the power and the purpose and all those good things of the cross. And how important it is in our lives. Not just in the church, but out in the world. We'll see y'all then. Y'all enjoy your lunch. So good to see everybody here this morning. It's uh, 